But from where I sit, American health policy is not only broken, it's broken in profoundly unethical ways. We need not only a high value, economically viable healthcare system, we need a just healthcare system. And let me say a couple of minutes, or my couple of minutes, about what I mean by that and how I think the film actually helps make the case without ever using the word justice. So, uh, by a healthcare system that's just, I mean, at minimum, one that present and future generations can rely on uh, for access for everyone to adequate, appropriate health care delivered with respect and dignity that uh, does not result in the imposition of undue, impossible financial burdens on patients and their families. And I think you see in the film, uh, most obviously in the remote area of the medical uh, clinic in Virginia, but also in the experiences of Roy Litton, the story of Yvonne Osborne, it's less clear, and a different kind of injustice, extraordinary story in the case of uh, Sergeant Yates, which I'd love to know, I'd like to know where you found such an extraordinary man, young man. But the justice concerns in the film, and this is my last uh, point, go well beyond healthcare itself. Uh, justice is about the wider social structural forces that have pervasive and persistent effects on every dimension of human well-being, including health. It's about power, it's about who has it and who doesn't, it's about self-determination, it's about who controls the wider forces that affect our health. And this is what is so well presented in the film and rarely connected up in stories about healthcare. So things like it's very important to emphasize. It's about why we eat what we eat, it's why medicines are marketed and priced the way they are. It's why this film is about more than healthcare. It's about some of the societal institutions and some of the wider social policies that affect health, that keep us from being healthier people and from being a healthier nation. And I think it's one of the film's most important contributions. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. If you want to go next, oh, why don't we Shannon? Sure. We'll give you, we give you enough chance to catch your breath. You know, it's interesting. I am. Um, the last time I was here at Johns Hopkins was about five years ago, and boy, the hospital's gone, been on a building spree. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's beautiful. These buildings are beautiful, but, um, and I'll get to why this connects to the film, but I wonder about what the true contribution to the health of Baltimore is. In a city that is as poor as Baltimore, or as as, as many, poor pockets as Baltimore is investing so much in beautiful buildings and expanding the capacity of this hospital to truly contribute to the health of Baltimore. I'm not sure that it does. And I think this is one of the, it's sort of a metaphor for um, what has been going on in our country for um, to some degree for a century, but very much accelerated in the last 50 years, which is that we are investing enormous amounts of money in one sector of our economy without asking the question of whether or not it's really doing the thing that it's supposed to do, which is helping make people healthier. And there are many, many miraculous things that, that medicine can do, astonishing things that medicine can do. But um, it's very clear that it does too much of many of them and um, doesn't attend to some of the simpler things that really make um, a population healthy. And we have to re-allocate um, resources as a society. And this is going to be very, very painful because when you talk about something that is um, nearly 20% of the economy, you're talking about a lot of money, but you're also really talking about a lot of people's livelihoods. So when we talk about healthcare reform, it has, it's going to have real meaning for the lives of millions and millions of people, but we, the, the imperative is very clear for all the reasons that you just enumerated. So I appreciated many, many aspects of the film. Um, it was a lot of fun working with Matt and um, the, the, I had a lot of fun at Sundance with, with the uh, cameraman and um, seeing the film aired there the first time was very exciting and I hope that many, many people see this film. Well, thank you.
both. Um, thank you all for being here. I think um, you know I'll keep my comments uh, you know, brief. Um, I think you all know my opinion. <laughs> um, really, you know, it's, it's an honor to, to be to be screening here um, at one of the best or the best medical school in, in the um, in the country. And I think. For me as a filmmaker, you know, I, I had no background in medicine, I had no background in healthcare. Um, I was just a dumb filmmaker who, um, like many Americans, was really confused by what was happening. Um, just as the healthcare debate was heating up is when we started this film. And healthcare really became this political football that, you know, was being thrown back and forth. And, and we were just trying to understand, really trying to get through the, the um, hyperbolic sort of discussion around this topic and try to understand really why did this system come to be? Why does it not want to change? And try to highlight some people out there who are trying to change it. And I think, you know, we, we learned some very, um, you know, things that were new to us, you know, probably not new to you all. You know, we have a disease care system, not a healthcare system, that the more is not better. You know, why, why, why this quanti you know, qu quantity of equality happens? Um, and why you know we as consumers have to become more aware of, 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 of all of these factors. And I think you know one thing that I hope comes out of this film, and that I hope that we can do, is that really generate a discussion, a, a sane discussion around the topic of healthcare at all levels. And I think what I've learned from Shannon, what I've learned from Dr. Brower, what I've learned from everyone in this film, is that for real change to occur, it's not just going to happen here in this building. It's not going to happen. You know, down the street in Washington, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, in in one doctor's office around the country, it, it really really requires a massive mindset shift on all levels, um, from the you know CEOs of pharmaceutical companies to um, you know everyday Americans like me and, and doctors like you, um, to really look in the mirror and say, what kind of system do we want for the future? So. I hope that this film, and I hope you can walk away and continue this discussion far beyond these halls and, uh, and, and join us in, in, in what we hope to be sort of a cultural movement uh, in America. So that's my cheesy little stunt speech. So Dr. Hellman has joined us in the interim, um, delayed I think in part because you were screening uh, the film at Bayview earlier today. So thank you for being with us. I, I gave a very brief introduction, so I think people know who you are. And we're just asking for kind of the three minute take home messages from your perspective. Thanks very much. The um, film did uh, screen at Bayview at, from four to six o'clock and um, to a packed audience. And um, I, first I wanted to thank you for the film. I thought it was uh, overall a terrific film. I love metaphors, and I think the escape fire metaphor is a very powerful one. Um, <clears throat> it's a minor point, but I'll feel better after I say it. Um, um, I sort of gagged on the Cleveland Clinic, but that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was partisan. Thank you. It was so much better. <laughs> it's a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it's a name, too. Um, the, Second is that um, it, it was at Johns Hopkins in 1893 that an escape fire was set to the conflagration of ignorance and lousy medical education. And um, there were more matches that were set, but Hopkins was one of the important and uh, biggest and brightest and So I think that tradition should all inspire us to try to set escape fires. And on the Bayview campus, we talked after the movie about some of the escape fires that we thought uh, were beginning to be set and those that could be set, to your point, that all of us uh, can uh, participate uh, in this. Um, so I really thought the film was So thank you all for your um, concise comments. The, the remainder of our time, we really wanted to devote to uh, questions and, 
and answers from the, the panel. Um, so I would encourage you to, to ask questions rather than make uh, statements if, if you're um, able to do that. Uh, the second thing I want to just reiterate, which you heard earlier in the evening, but it's worth saying again, and that is tonight this film is being screened at some large number, I thought 50. Over 50 medical schools. Medical schools around the country. Um, we are privileged, really, to have both Shannon Brownlee and Matt Heineman here with us. It uh, so makes us sort of the premier spot among the 50. Uh, the other thing that we are doing, just so you know when you ask your questions, we are filming this part of the evening and it will be on the Berman Institute website maybe as soon as tomorrow. I don't know how quickly we can get it up. Um, but just know that you're being recorded for posterity. Uh, if you object to that, I guess the only way out is just not to ask a question. I can. All right, with that um, said, why don't we, I think it, the acoustics in here are good enough that we can hear you and I'll do my best to repeat the question for the purpose of taping and just uh, raise your hands and stand up and, and shout in the back. I'm gonna, it's hard for me to see, so it's gonna be hard for me to, to call on people. Mark, I'm a third year medical student. Um, thank you for, I think, very eloquently showing what I think a lot of us sort of feel, see every day and, and know the situation that's going on. And I think you did a great job of, without bias, showing it the way it is. So thank you for that. Um, my question to the panel is if you had to choose one thing to, to change, if you had to be aware, had the ability to make one change right now for the healthcare system, what would your change be? <laughs> While you, while you think about your answer to that very difficult question, I, I'm going to uh, repeat it just for the purpose of, of recording it. And it was a question about if you could change one thing about the American healthcare system, I assume we're talking about, what would it be? Shannon Brownlee will be first. The way we pay, fee for service. Um, it, it's a really fundamental and very deep problem in, in American healthcare. And, um, I think probably some combination of different payment models are probably going to be the best way to do it in, in, U in the U.S. because we're not going to have a, a system where the government hires physicians, where they're employees of the federal government anytime soon. And so I think what we need to do is, is do something called global budgeting for hospitals, um, which is, there used to be an old bad word for that, it was called capitation. But um, you basically pay a healthcare provider like a hospital a set amount for a set population of patients for a set period of time. Um, but fee-for-service will probably have some role to play. But it, it really is the fundamental problem is that we pay for value. We don't, I mean, excuse me, exactly the opposite. We pay for volume of services. We don't pay for the value to the patient. And that's the thing we really have to get away from. But, but that said, just changing the way we pay is not going to change the, the, um, the, the, the crucial piece of it, which is your professionalism, your sense of professionalism. And I think we have to strengthen that as well. Are we all answering this? Sure. <laughs> if you have an answer, please. Ah, uh, cool. yes. I mean, I, I, would, I would echo what Shannon says, but that's boring. Um, <laughs> the American way of life, I think, you know, I think we, you know, the fact that 75% of healthcare costs go to preventable diseases, obviously that's an incredibly multifactorial stat and problem uh, issue. And, but I think, you know, we as Americans, um, you know, have to take greater ownership of our health. And I think we as a country and as providers and as policymakers have to incentivize and encourage people and help people do that as well. So I think if I'm if I could wave, wave a macro wand, that would be that would be one of them. In addition to what Shannon said. <laughs> that, that seems fine. Well whispering down the line, I, I'm not sure what I would I don't like having to pick one thing. <laughs> Certainly, the way we the way we finance healthcare, I would agree with Shannon completely, is something that has to change. You asked your question about healthcare, uh, as opposed to our overall set of policies that affect why we are less healthy than, than we could be. I would, if we could open it up to that, I would certainly want to do something significant about food policy in the United States, and we could have a conversation about that if you like 
I would also love to get rid of direct to consumer advertising for pharmacy. Here, here. Which happens yeah. to be one of the Okay. Whatever. And, and we could go down the list. These are all to continue with the metaphor that, that David was describing. There's so many escape fires we know we can light, each of which would would help. Also, want a healthcare system in which no one was afraid uh, to go to a doctor because they couldn't afford to pay. Uh, and you know, obviously, healthcare reform, as the bill was passed, will help a lot with that. But it will not eliminate uh, that problem for, for many, many, many people. And we should should be measured. That. So they say, if you want to herd cats, move the food bowl. <laughs> and so I think the idea of moving the food bowl or the way healthcare is provided makes a lot of sense. I think that would reduce a lot of, help reduce a lot of the wrongs. There's still a lot that we don't have answers to. We don't have answers about how it is in this day we work most effectively as teams. There are um, yeah, so a, a lot about uh, the safety movement that we don't yet have solved and so if I had my wish, it would be to take two months of the um, what it costs to fight in Iraq and use that $30 billion to set up a National Institutes of Health Care, which would finance innovations in, um, in education and in patient safety. I want the NIH to, uh, to be around still a lot of people suffering from terrible diseases that we need to seek cures for. So biomedical research uh, we need, but we have an unbalance in our innovation portfolio and that we chiefly have been innovating in biomedical science and not innovating in the process of care or how we educate doctors, nurses, how we work together. And so I think there's a tremendous amount that we could accomplish through innovations if the funds were available. The Medicare innovation grants, I think, are showing how a small amount of money can bring people out of the woodwork. So here at Johns Hopkins, we had something like 60 people come forward to put in proposals for um, uh, innovative ways to take care of people. So the juices are ready to, uh, to roll uh, if they're is a way to sustain. Thank you all. Over here, please. Um, I'm a current BSN to NFN student um, and have a master's degree in public health. And um, a lot of the movie was about doctors. Um, once there was a mention of a yoga instructor, a nurse, and I think another member. Um, but I think healthcare and safety, especially, um, holistic care has to do with a lot more than just doctors, um, especially with more. In Coming up and more PAs coming up, um, and I'm part of a full fellowship, which is just about safety and quality of care. Um, and so I'm curious what you guys see for other members of the medical team, um, other primary care providers, other than MDs, and um, if they fit into that team, I hope I jump in and feel myself, and how they go into this into the system to make things better. So let me just repeat that while we're, we're waiting for you all to formulate your thoughts. So the question really was about the role for non-physician healthcare providers and members of healthcare teams in terms of the future of successful American healthcare. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. Um, should we start at the other end, Dave, first and work back? You're right. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the small escape fires we tried to set at Bayview to try to make this point is that in the last year we named one of our inpatient units after a nurse. It's the first time that I believe in Hopkins history that any uh, inpatient location has been named after anyone other than a rich person or a physician. <laughs> and we wanted to send a message that Healthcare is, uh, health is a team sport, and that we had to make sure that we recognize uh, other members. Now, having said that, unfortunately, we haven't been able to name one yet after a social worker, a pharmacist, 
all of everyone um, needs to participate in putting out the forest fire that is the conflagration of the health care crisis. I just have a, a question. Brief comment. The, so, if we if we look at systems around the United States that have actually um, started really um, drilling down on on how to deliver care more efficiently, more safely, um, to to make sure that that chronically ill patients have the care they need at the primary care setting, which is really crucially important. It turns out that that patients are hospitalized less often if you get really good primary care. And, um, and if hospitals really do a good job of getting more efficient, they end up needing um, fewer very high-level specialists in a lot of cases and end up having, um, being able to use other um, providers, other clinicians, uh, like nurses, like NPs, like physical therapists, et cetera, et cetera. And if we were to sort of imagine being able to roll that out across the United States, many of the innovations that we already know work, we could roll those out and implement them across the United States, what it would suggest is that our per capita needs for physicians may be lower than they are now. And our per capita needs for, um, for different kinds of caregivers, especially as the population becomes frail and elderly, um, is going to be much greater. So we're going to have to have a very, very different kind of healthcare workforce. And we're not thinking about that right now. We're busy kind of trying to replicate the the system that we've been going along for the last 50 years. And um, we have an enormous need for really taking care of people in very, very different ways. And it's probably going to be in less intensive ways and often less use of hospital-based care. I'll just, I agree with everything that's been said. I think you're completely right on. Um, from my perspective as a filmmaker and what I saw, you know, I, I think just, and just to give a quick anecdote from the film, I think the story of Sergeant Yates, um, you know, the injured soldier in the film, and, and to me is, is a prime example of that. And, and you know, seeing, when I first met him in Germany and saw him, you know, so broken, um, both mentally, physically, emotionally, um, and seeing what ensued on that plane, um, that, I mean, that was a classic example of uncoordinated Care, where, where he had, the reason he was on all those drugs is because he had many, many different doctors giving them to him. No one coordinating, no one knowing what he's on. He was self-medicating. Um, there's, there's, you know, very little overlap uh, in terms of his care. When he, you know, got back to Walter Reed months later, and, you know, through the transition that we followed him, as you see in the film, you know, it was that much more team-based, integrative approach um, that, you know, I, I, whether it was the acupuncture, the meditation, or, or psychotherapy, um, I don't know. But I know that it was that, that group effort, that, that, that care, that high touch um, health care that he was given, which allowed him to really prosper and, and you know, ultimately walk out on his own two feet. Um, sadly, when he left there, which is not in the movie, when he went back to his base, he went back to nothing. He went back to fragmented care. Went back to, um, you know, all these different people picking at different pieces of him, different specialists going up here and others going down here and others down here, and he was not in a good place mentally, physically, at all. I mean, and when I went to go visit him, I, I honestly felt like I was going to visit like one flew of the cuckoo's nest. I mean, it was like there had been three suicides in in. Uh, um, within a, a couple week period there. And it was just, it was really sad to see how uncoordinated that was. He since has left there and he's doing much better and he's in a much better place. But it's just a, a classic example of the importance of, of team care and the importance of just care in general. I think when he was given, when he felt like people cared about him, he did well. And I think you all know that better than I do, but I think that was a really powerful thing for me to witness. change the payment system to Well, even, even if you change it so that we're paying for preventative care instead of fee-for-service, who's going to do the change? Uh, how it ought to be or how it ought to be? How it ought to be. <laughs> how it ought to be. Yeah. 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 
this is recommendation time, right? Fun question, right? It is on. I'm just being lazy and not holding it up. But thank you, JP. So, how it ought to be is is a very different question from what could happen realistically in the United States in the next ten years, right? So, if we, um, uh, you may have noticed the comment, the person who was the former insurance the Cigna executive, the defector from the insurance industry, uh, was saying there were two aims that the insurance industry had in the healthcare debate. One was the mandate, and the other was to make sure there was no public option. Yeah. Pay attention to the second one, yeah. right? Unless and until we have the equivalent of a public option, and we'll hold out for a national health system, but a public option, uh, the prospects for being able to uh, really make healthcare available to everybody who is in the United States is problematic. There's a small segment of people who will continue to have difficulty getting any kind of assistance to the U.S. government, and that's people who are not here legally. So most people should know uh, by now that people who are not in this country legally right, are not eligible to buy into the exchanges with their own money. That was one of the compromises that went into the health care reform bill to get passed. The most recent version of this that emerged, I don't know how many of you have followed uh, the uh, position of the administration that now lets people who are not here legally but who came here as children and who essentially grown up in the United States to apply for this interim status that will allow them to stay here without fear of deportation for some period of time. It's unclear what their future will be. The latest ruling from HHS is these uh, young people will not be eligible, even though they are now here legally they are not eligible to buy into uh, the health exchanges with their own money or otherwise use any of the provisions of the health care bill. So how it ought to be and how it's likely to happen in the United States for a, you know, for a long time is going to be, there's going to be another one of those asks. Uh, someone, I can't remember who it was in the film, I'm looking at the two of you, you should know, uh, was talking about how the problem, the focus on health care reform has been so much on reducing the percentage of people who are uninsured. And the implication being, we can do that, but we're still going to have an unsustainable system of, until we do something about quality and cost, and more importantly, about health more generally. And I think that's right. I think it's a mistake to pit one against the other. So from an ethics standpoint, what frustrates me is the, the sort of divide that sometimes happens in health policy debates between people who want to focus on uh, guaranteed access to the healthcare system as we have it, and people who want to say, that's not really the issue, the real issue is how do we we shouldn't really have to choose here, right? They're really linked up together. Until we can make the healthcare system more efficient and higher quality, we're not going to have the resources to make it available to everybody. So it's really hydraulic and not really, as I see it, sort of in, in contention. Take your position. Others of you want to weigh in on the how we how we pay for it? No. Okay. <laughs> it's a hard one. Yes, sir. My name is Andrew, I'm a third year medical student, uh, but I also used to be a high school teacher here in Baltimore City. And um, I just found it interesting that although we don't have, you know, a government-run healthcare system, we do have um, the public school system, which um, can be very useful in playing a large role in making sure that, you know, healthy choices and health education start early on. Um, because it really starts with, uh, with young people. So I was wondering how you see health education and just the education system in general fitting into all of this, um, since we're trying to move toward a more preventive model of care. You wanted to talk about food policy. This, this was your chance. Well, I wanted to do both. But, uh, so it's not just food policy. I mean, we know that one of the simple best predictors <coughs> of health is education. Forget whether there's a word of health in your education. Just the most important thing I think that can happen for a school system is to get people to graduate from high school. So the best thing you can do for the health of kids, even more than improving the food in the cafeteria, would be find a way to get them to graduate. Right? Uh, and from there on, to go beyond, but certainly get them to graduate from high school. In addition, though, we can do tremendous amounts of things. We can do many things to improve the, the context in which children come to understand what's acceptable and good food. We could have a whole, I don't remember, I don't, I don't 
some of you as you've heard my spiel and you know if Gail Geller and other people organized the section Joe on obesity for the medical school. What year is that? Is that first year or second year? First year students. And we can never talk enough about the, the food policy issues that, that the schools can play a central central role in, but it's not only food. Uh, food though is is key. Uh, I was really struck Safeway CEO. I, every time we talk about obesity and food policy, generally somebody brings up the food choices in the cafeterias here on our on campus. Uh, it's an inevitable link, and uh, you know the world's not perfect. But my my response to that is, uh, kids in particular, right, need to be set in an environment in which the food available to them is all good for that. Uh, adults, we can get into a debate about uh, what's, what Senator Wyden said, you know, people have a right to be foolish, right? We don't have a right to let kids be foolish. So that's the line that I think. So I'm going to be just slightly cranky person here about the whole idea about prevention saving us money. Um, people are still going to die. We're still mortal. And so the reason we want to do preventive medicine and we want to have a question before we move to maybe just one last question. Great. David. So I think that there are three great problems um, for us in health that academic medical centers could address. Number one is to say that academic medical centers will take, do its part to bend the cost curve down. What made Hopkins great 130 years ago was its willingness to dedicate itself to the notion that medicine is a public trust and that we solve the important problems in front of the American people. And the problems are now that it costs too damn much and that the uh, quality is too, uh, too variable. And thirdly, that we, as the movie put it, we have focused on uh, disease management, but have not tried to own health. I think it was Emerson who said, health is the first wealth. And um, if, as a group, we say that th these are our goals, that we need to own health, the promotion of health, then I think it would take us um, to uh, focusing more on education in the schools. I've often wondered at the success of Teach for America, and um, couldn't we have a similar remarkable success if we offered fellowships to bright young people who wanted to teach health for America? And, um, uh, and in return for taking people for two years and teaching them something about education, something about science, something about health, that they help us work in the communities, including our schools. We need to own it. Just one quick thing is I, uh, I think that's incredibly important. 
I actually got rejected from Teach for America, and that's why I became a filmmaker. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sometimes, answers your question. Sometimes they screw the up. The end too. of one. Sorry that we 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 couldn't combine the you know, eavesdrop and, and the conversation that occurred at Bayview because I really would have loved to have heard the conversation about escape fighters that we can we can light here and I just wanted to put a plug in for uh, some of you may know about the incredible work that is happening here at Hopkins in patient safety and and health uh, quality improvement I think we can be very proud uh, of that work which is very much involving uh, many healthcare professionals was led by Peter Pronovost, but involving people uh, from many, many parts of, of this institution. And uh, it's really, really incredible, in, incredible work. And uh, you know, I'm happy that, 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 that so many people are involved and engaged in it. And I bet if we made a list, and I don't know how long the list would be, of work that's going on here and in the School of Public Health and in the School of Nursing, and we put it all together, So I almost always agree with Dr. Faden and hesitate to disagree, but I think this is, um, the film is an upper, not a down. I mean, what better things could you want in life that what you do counts? What you do now counts, and you're in a place and in a position where you can make a difference. There are some times in life, perhaps, where you people could just yawn and sleep and it wouldn't make any difference. But you can't do that. We can't do that. The country can't do that. Uh, we need everybody in here to help go out and set escape fires. And if we do, um, we can change it. And wouldn't that be nice? Cool. That's a perfect note on which to end. I think, Matt, you want the very last word? They had Siskel and Ebert go in there, so maybe you should stop with that. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, I think the film is both an upper and a downer. And I think, you know, just going off of what you said, I think that one of the tragedies for me is that, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of the list that you, that you just referenced. Um, I, you know, I would love to learn more about it. But I think that's one of the tragedies, is that there are many, many wonderful escape fires all across the country. But why can't we fix this problem? You know, why, 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 why do we spend twice as much as any other country in the world that are at or near the bottom of every single health metric. Why? You know, why, why can't this happen everywhere? And so I urge all of you to go back to wherever you practice, to wherever you end up, and try to really affect change. Because I think, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to be, this is, I'll be pessimistic about this, I don't know if we can wait for Washington for change. I think change will really happen community by community, hospital by hospital. And, uh, you know, I urge all of you in that vein, the only way a film like this really succeeds and gets its message out is by word of mouth. So please tell everyone you know to go see the film. If you're on, if you're a tweeter or a Facebooker, please go on and, and spread the word and, and, and tell everyone the film is actually coming out officially uh, on October 5th in theaters, on iTunes, on video on demand. So please spread the word um, and please join us in, in this conversation. So. Thanks, Matt. Now, let me say, Matt, you know, oh, sure. Then I'm going to wrap up, I promise. There's also, I mean, there's a, there's a website, and this is the, the Department of Shameless Promotion um, of Matt and of something I'm working on. Um, Matt's put together, and his team have put together a website with a lot of different resources, and one of those resources is a link to a site that we're putting together specifically for medical students and medical residents, which is... Um, on the problem of overtreatment and, and overdiagnosis with um, 
a lot of information, a lot of resources for you, a, uh, a forum for talking to other, other folks around the country, and we're starting to build specific <coughs> things that you can start doing to really change that piece of medical culture, of, of the tendency towards overdiagnosis and overtreatment to really push it towards the other direction, which is the appropriate care and the right care. So I urge you to go on the website and spread the word about the film. Website is theskiafiremovie.com and our Facebook is facebook.com slash theskiafire. And if you have those cards, we, we spent like twenty nine dollars on them each. Um, so if you if you could fill them out, if you feel so inclined, we'd love to know what what your escape fires are. So we're gonna we're gonna put them on Pinterest. We're gonna spread them around. So um, please share with us. Thank you all so much. that change is slow and hard, but you have really helped speed up the pace. And so for that, we commend you and your colleagues. I want to say a few more thanks um, to the med students who organized this and really brought us together, and that's uh, Shiv and Howard and Kate and whomever else I'm forgetting. Thank you. Very much. say uh, thank you to Stephanie Cooper Greenberg who really brought the film to many of our attention and I think she was here I saw her at one point so thank you Stephanie for letting us know about the film. Thank you all for coming. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, go